uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm about to drop a citation. We were talking about a paper uh, earlier. So this is the, the name of the, the paper and uh, Eric Wood is the, the author, the lead author on that one. Um, so that's about street trees and, and birds, but I'd like to talk generally about uh, native plants and birds and, and why uh, that connection is so strong. And uh, I'm gonna provide some suggestions for some native plants that you can use. So um, here's what, what we're gonna get into this evening. So I'm gonna share a little bit about myself, a little bit about where I work. Uh, we're gonna talk sort of broadly about this connection between native plants and birds. If you don't already know um, why they are so in, uh, inextricably linked, um, a little bit about design principles and then uh, the bulk of this, or at least half of the slides, are going to be some of my favorite plants for attracting birds. Uh, and we're going to talk about these plants in, in terms of their food value uh, for birds. So depending on what kinds of birds you might want to attract uh, based on their kind of guild. Um, so let's get into it. Um, my name is Scott, and I am the Director of Education and Engagement for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. I'm originally from San Diego. I, uh, upon graduating high school, went to UCLA where I studied geography and I emphasized uh, biogeography and ecology. Um, and then I did some work as an environmental educator uh, in San Mateo County and Boulder, Colorado. Um, went to grad school in Tucson, a great place for birds. If, if you've never been, I highly recommend checking out Tucson and the Sonoran Desert and the Sky Islands, uh, great plants, great birding. Uh, I studied landscape architecture there. And uh, then I went, came back to California and I worked for Tejon Ranch Conservancy, which is a whole nother story. I think I, I see some folks that, that I may have uh, been on Tejon with at some times here on this call, which is pretty cool. Uh, really fascinating property. If you haven't heard about that, property, um, you should really educate yourself a little bit about Tejon Ranch, Tejon Ranch Conservancy, and some of the uh, developments that are planned out there, and uh, especially in LA County. Um, if you are an LA County resident, please uh, communicate about how you feel about potentially uh, 10,000 acres of native grassland in the Antelope Valley being converted to a city uh, out there on Tejon Ranch. Just uh, shout out for that project. Uh, and I've worked in New Mexico. That's, there I am with my oldest daughter birding in the Santa Fe Reser River Preserve. And uh, I need to update these ages soon, uh, actually, because Caliandra is seven, almost eight, and Micah and Ruby, the twins, will be four in just a few weeks. Um, so the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is the, um, the first native plant botanic garden in our nation. Um, Frederick Clements, who's kind of an interesting name, uh, just in terms of the field of ecology, he coined the term ecological succession. Uh, I know that that is not en vogue, thinking about succession as a, a major ecological uh, driver. We talk more about uh, state transition models and all that these days, but it was seminal at the time. Um, and really what we, what we emphasize is uh, conserving California native plants and habitats for the health and well-being of people and planet. And we sometimes talk about there being three legs to our stool. And uh, one of them is our conservation and research department. Uh, Chris was mentioning the, the Dudleya work that's happening across the, the state. Um, the garden is actually rehabilitating uh, quite a few Dudleya from the um, Conejo Volcanics. Uh, I forget what taxon it is, but they, they had been poached uh, they were confiscated, we're rehabilitating them and working on reintroducing them, uh, which is, is pretty cool. And uh, we've got a number of projects throughout the state on the mainland and on the Channel Islands. Um, we focus on horticulture. So the, the garden has introduced, I think, something like 35 cultivars and selections of California native plants to the trade. Some of the ones that you may have heard of are Verbena de la Mina, um, or uh, one of my favorites, I don't know how popular it is in the trade, but the Canyon Gray Artemisia, uh, which I think we'll talk about a little bit today. It's a um, really nice selection um, and, and several others. If the name Canyon is in the, the cultivar name, 
Uh, it probably comes from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. That was a convention that longtime propagator Dara Emery started, uh, I think back in the, the 60s or 70s. Uh, and of course, education is the other leg of the stool. So um, why, why birds? And so I have this animated GIF here, which is uh, based on eBird data. So eBird.org, if you haven't checked it out, it's a, a citizen science platform where you can submit your observations of birds. Each one of these dots represents a, a bird taxon. And um, what we're seeing is observations over the course of the year. So we're watching these birds move across hemispheres. So for one thing, from a conservation standpoint, if we really wanna protect birds throughout their entire life history, think of all the habitat that we have to protect in between. Um, and I do see a, a raised hand, so I'll just take that right now. Geneva, did you have a question or comment? Sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, all right, high five. Um, so what we're seeing is this uh, citizen science data here showing that these birds uh, cross, cross hemispheres. Uh, and so I think, you know, there's significant conservation value to considering birds and all of the habitats that they need um, across the globe. Um, there's also, I think for me, you know, this question of like how fulfilling it is uh, for myself and, and I know the brain doesn't function this way, but we often talk about the two hemispheres of the brain, uh, the left side of the brain being more focused on data, linear thinking like that uh, animation I just showed, um, hard data and, and those sorts of patterns. Whereas um, the right side of the brain is a little bit more on um, creativity and, um, and we'll do an exercise to demonstrate that in just a second. So I, I think, for me, watching birds, I've, I've got the, the qualitative and the quantitative that I'm, I'm considering when I'm doing bird watching. I'm thinking about habitat and conservation and, and how many acres or hectares or what, what's the territory size of this bird. And I wonder what the phenology is, but I'm also trying to identify the bird. So I'm, I'm looking at the contours of the body and I'm uh, paying attention to, to the patterns and I'm listening to the sounds they make. And I'm really going into what some people refer to as that kind of flow pattern. Um, so for me, it's a way to just engage my whole self and, and be really in, um, in the natural world, which is to me very beautiful. Um, so we're going to do an exercise to sort of demonstrate this. So if I can ask people to maybe get a, a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper ready, we're going to do what I call a 30 second art class. And uh, so in a second, I'm, I'm going to show the silhouette of a bird. And what I'd like you to do is take 30 seconds to try to sketch that outline, try to draw that outline of the bird. Um, and then uh, we'll just talk about that for a moment. All right. So has everybody got your, your writing utensil and a piece of paper? Um, so let's see if I can pull up this image. So here's your silhouette. You have 30 seconds starting now. Take about 10 more seconds. All right, so um, maybe maybe when you were drawing, uh, well, here's the bird. Uh, this is a, a scrub jay. This is actually a Woodhouse's scrub jay from uh, when I was in Santa Fe, uh, but it was a nice photo. So I continue to use it. California scrub jay is a little bit different, but structurally very similar. Um, so maybe you noticed uh, this bill, which uh, starts to key us into what does this bird eat? This is a generalist's bill. So this bird eats anything it wants to. 
Um, they eat acorns, of course. You may see them right now. I don't know how it is down on the, the south coast, but the uh, Quercus are all starting to, to bear fruits right now, particularly the agrifolia, but a few other tacks that we have in the, the garden. Um, the Quercus pacifica, the, the island scrub oak has a lot of acorns on it right now, and Dumosa in the garden, the leather oak, uh, also has a lot of acorns on it, which is kind of cool. Um, but this bird will also eat lizards and eggs and grubs and uh, all kinds of other things, peanuts. Um, or maybe you notice just that, that how shallow the crown of the head is. Uh, or perhaps you notice the length of the tail, which um, tells us a little bit about the bird's life history. This is a, a woodland creature. So this long tail acts as a great rudder for it to maneuver uh, in among the chaparral and the oak woodlands, um, these tight spaces. So, uh, you know, in that way, we sort of engage our, our whole brain. And it, it's also this exercise in kind of understanding the birds a little bit more. And the, the more we understand the birds and the more we understand the life history, the better we can provide for them throughout their life history. So when we're thinking about bird habitat, we have to think like a bird, I guess. Um, and so here are a few principles that we can consider in terms of actually creating um, that bird habitat. So I have three, um, three structural principles to consider. One is layers of habitat. So as you see on that left photo, um, you have this nice ground plane. Um, you have a nice mid story, you have a nice canopy. And so that supports lots of different types of birds. Some birds prefer to stay on the ground. Um, some birds prefer to be in the, in the trees gleaning on the leaves and some want uh, a perch with a little bit of open space and some edges. Very often birds want open edges um, as well. So having these layers is an important consideration. Um, thinking about escape routes. So one thing, um, there's a, a book I read uh, a number of years ago, it's called Field Notes on Science and Nature. And it's an edited volume. And it's um, a really interesting kind of take on uh, field journaling. And so there are all these authors talking about uh, field journaling and the importance of field journaling to their practice. And some of them are scientists and some of them are artists. And one of the artists is talking about value. Um, so when, when we're sketching or drawing, we think about the, the value of our colors and we have to think about what's the darkest dark that we have in our, in our painting. Or if you think about the photo in the middle here, what's the darkest dark you have and what's the lightest light? Well, the birds are thinking about value too because the darkest dark represents shelter. It represents shadow, it represents escape. So I encourage you to start as you walk, if you don't do this already, to watch as the, the birds disperse from you, because in, inevitably you are going to scare them in your um, wanderings, and they'll probably, you know, shotgun burst away from you. Watch where they go. Oftentimes they're going to go to a shadow. They're going to go right to the nearest, darkest place that they can find. So giving them those shadows to escape to is important. And then finally, this idea of roosting and, and perching, where are they going to sleep? Where are they going to sit when they want to get cool um, or uh, create a nest? Um, so, you know, structurally, we can start to think about what birds need in terms of their shelter. Um, we can also think about another major amazing part of bird life history, which is the entire nesting process, which is, you know, biologically kind of miraculous unto itself. Um, but beyond that, if you think about the sort of ecological requirements for some of these nests. They require multiple ingredients. Uh, uh, many kinds of materials are being pulled together to create these nests. And so that means we have to have a lot of different kinds of plant materials around, and we have to have structure for other organisms like spiders. Spider webs are a really common ingredient in a lot of uh, bird nests, particularly as you see, uh, that uh, hummingbird nest in the uh, Catalina ironwood. Um, so thinking about also location, birds nest in different places. So our dark-eyed juncos and our spotted towhees are, are ground nesters, as you can see in that bottom photo. Um, but then there are other birds like our hummingbirds, which will, will nest you know, at about one meter to three meters up. And then you have, of course, other birds where we typically think of nests up in the canopy. Um, but, you know, vireos, gnatcatchers, 
um, all kinds of birds will create nests at sort of that mid-level canopy. So again, having these layers of habitat is pretty critical uh, for multiple portions of the bird's life history. And so now there's this question, because that's all structural stuff, and we can kind of achieve almost all of that without native plants. Um, but why do we emphasize native plants? And I don't think I need to really um, convince anybody here, but I think you know one of the most compelling reasons that we've been really keying in on at the garden that a lot of our research is, is starting to really emphasize is this relationship between uh, native plants and native insects. And so as you see, you know, herbivorous insects um, uh, represent an enormous proportion of terrestrial life. Um, and for the most part, these herbivorous insects have very tight relationships with plants, whether they have a requirement for a larval host plant, like the hair streak you see on the upper photo. Um, I think they like cercocarpus. Um, or um, if say the, the organism is a buzz pollinator that needs a flower like that manzanita flower um, on the bottom. So, um, you know, supporting the insects is extremely important and native plants are empirically better at supporting native insects than any other kind of plant. And so there's, there's kind of a trophic um, aspect to this as you move up the, the trophic pyramid, the ecological pyramid of energy. So it starts up with the sun that provides, you know, the lion's share of the energy for the planet. The plants convert that into usable sugar and energy for other organisms. And then you have largely the insects that are kind of the primary consumers of that energy. But then we've got this relationship um, with the songbirds. And, and so, you know, these are pretty incredible stats, right? Especially if you look at that bottom bullet. And we know that Lepidoptera as, as a group, as an order, tends to have this really tight relationship with uh, with plants, right? We we talk about monarchs quite a bit, but you know, virtually all of the the butterflies and and moths have larval host plants that they require. Um, so now we start to make this connection that native plants are supporting these ecological relationships in a very direct way and in a way that um, really radiates out. And I think we can make a very compelling argument that native biodiversity and species richness are directly tied to the native plants. And so we can talk about native plants are beautiful and native plants uh, evoke California and native plants are, are water conserving. And these are all very good reasons. Um, but I, I think this story to me is um, a really compelling one for us to tell. And it, it sort of invites this inquiry about native plants and the relationships. And, and it, for me at least, gets me really excited about understanding these relationships and facilitating uh, these, these kinds of interactions between organisms. And so there's, there's, to me, there's a lot of promise in this uh, kind of rationale. So now let's, let's talk about, okay, so hopefully you are already convinced, but I've convinced you a little more that native plants are, are the way to go. Um, and they're the way to support native avifauna and, and other ecological relationships. And so how, how do you do it? And um, I can't not put in a few slides about this because I have a degree in landscape architecture and I have to use it somehow. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about this process of design. Um, so, you know, goal setting. I, I think it's important to start to ask what birds are you trying to attract? Uh, and when are you trying to attract them? You know, that hooded oriole or um, uh, the bullock's oriole, um, you know, you're only going to attract it for some time of the year. The fox sparrow um, is, is primarily going to be in your yard at a certain time of year, whereas the acorn woodpecker uh, is uh, a bird that's, that's going to be around year round. Uh, the yellow rumped warbler, again, is, is seasonal. That's more of a winter bird. So, um, asking yourself, uh, what are you, um, who are you hoping to attract? Now, I'm sorry, that's a hooded Oriole rather than Bullocks. I, I apologize to the birders in the room. Um, what kind of maintenance regime are you interested? 
And, and then for me, I always just think it's important to ask, does this effort dovetail with other home improvement projects, such as gray water harvesting or um, developing a rain uh, water catchment system, passive rainwater harvesting, or other projects you might have, how, how would it dovetail with the creation of habitat? And then, you know, really looking at your site conditions, um, Google Earth is, is amazing. Um, there are all kinds of ways to get topographic information on your site. Think about your um, sun and shade patterns. Uh, really think about your cardinal directions, of course, but uh, how do a little site analysis do the buildings around you provide shade? Are there already pre-existing trees that provide canopy and shade? Even if they're non-native trees, a tree is a, a very valuable thing in the home habitat. So thinking about maybe a succession plan, um, do you wanna just cut down your, your shade tree and, and plant a five gallon oak that's gonna take a long time to replace that shade? Or is there some sort of successional planting that you're going to do? Um, so really thinking about your site and what's going to make a lot of sense for your site and your own comfort. Um, you know, don't, don't get rid of your shade tree just for the sake of planting something that will be better habitat 10 years down the line if you can no longer sit outside and enjoy the shade of the shade tree. Um, so you have to kind of make these value judgments, but also um, spend some time flipping rocks in your yard. Spend some time looking at what birds are already in your yard. You can use a platform like eBird, or if you don't use uh, iNaturalist, I recommend checking out iNaturalist.org. You could submit observations from your site and uh, engage the community uh, in identification of those organisms. Um, you know, and also what kinds of views or is there noise that you want to uh, screen out? So really thinking about your design in terms of your abode, your habitat as an individual. What do you need? What are the views you want? Do you wanna be able to look out the window at your breakfast nook and have a nice little habitat uh, that you've created? Well, then perhaps you don't wanna put a shrub right in front of that window, um, so things like that. And then, um, you know, the elements of design. So really thinking about these principles like your unity and variety um, do you want a one of everything design or do you want a more uniform design? Um, do you want a, a uniform design where you have one thing that's a little bit different so you have this emphasis? Um, what kinds of conventions are you using in terms of symmetry and balance? Are you um, trying to emulate Versailles or are you interested in more of a, a Japanese Zen uh, kind of rock garden sort of look where you're really thinking more about triangles than, than pure symmetry and balance? Uh, native plants, I think, are, are wonderful at providing sort of rhythmic, uh, some of these hummocky plants. I mentioned um, the canyon gray artemisia before, which is one that really creates those rhythmic hummocks that, that I, I really enjoy, and they create lots of good habitat. Um, and then thinking of your form givers, what, what is your pre-existing circulation? Um, how do you want to move through the site? Do you want to be able to walk directly through the middle of your garden or is it something that you walk around? Um, what are the views into and out of your site? And what are those desire lines? You know, when, when people get out of the driveway or when people park in front of your house, are they just gonna step on that, that bed that you've uh, carefully planned and planted because they don't see the low growing shrub that you've put there? Uh, maybe you wanna note where are people walking right now when they park in front of your house and and start going towards the front door. And you might not wanna put plants there. Um, what are your existing features? And then, you know, what do you wanna do there? Is, it a, is this really about indoor outdoor living? Is this uh, something that you're going to be looking at from the inside? Or is this more about curb appeal? You want people to be looking into your yard and see something beautiful and functional as a habitat. And then this question of maintenance, of course, um, you know, some of the messiest plants are some of the best plants for birds. So are, are you willing to deal with uh, a season of leaves falling below your tree? So that gander oak in that top photo is in our Waterwise home garden and it's a gorgeous tree. It's an incredible tree, but it drops leaves like the Dickens during a certain time of year. And uh, you know, that, that creates a maintenance issue, uh, particularly as we are, uh, kind of a, a, sh a display garden. And so we don't want leaves all over the path uh, or thinking about the toy on berries. 
you know, some of these plants, the, the birds are going to eat the berries and then something has to happen after the bird eats the berries. It, it's got to process it through its digestive system. Uh, and so if you have those nice perches and the perches right above your outdoor table, um, what's going to happen when, after the birds eat and then they perch? Um, can you tolerate, and I'm sure many of you are, are already sensitive to this, holding off on deadheading uh, some of your plants, some of your salvias, uh, some of your, you know, if even like helianthus and, and things like that, um, letting it just sit out there so the birds can pluck away at it. It's going to look a little ratty. It's not going to, you know, be as aesthetic as far as um, formal gardening goes, but it's providing great habitat for the birds. And it might be attracting certain birds during important shoulder seasons like migration. Uh, and then of course you have to make considerations for firescaping. That's a whole another subject, um, but just making sure you're, you're being careful of your roof lines. Um, you know, one nice thing about, especially uh, basins is there's some anecdotal evidence that's kind of supporting the idea that um, places that, that have wetted soil uh, where we're directing some of our, our rainwater or um, we're using grain, gray water from our, our laundry or something like that um, to these mulch basins, uh, they can actually provide a little bit of a buffer. Uh, it's not that it's going to save your home from fire necessarily, uh, but there are some anecdotes about folks having these sorts of setups and, and being spared, um, whereas some neighbors were not quite as lucky. There's also luck of the draw. Um, but it's a consideration for sure. So now um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. And I guess I'll just pause for a second and see um, how folks are doing. Um, anybody have any questions? Okay. Cool. Uh, so now I'd like to just talk about native plants for birds. And um, as I mentioned before, kind of organizing them in terms of the food that they provide uh, for the birds. So you see the categories I have are fruit, seed, nectar, insect, uh, and then uh, just general, you know, all stars that I really like. And, you know, I, I do want to qualify a couple of things. One, um, I, I am not a horticulturalist. So um, if there are questions about the, the culture of these plants and, and tough care and maintenance questions, uh, I'm going to say right now, I'll probably have to get back to you on that, but I'm, I'm happy to take those questions and write them down and, and talk to folks. And of course, if there are folks in, among us uh, right now who have answers, I, I welcome you to share if any of those questions come up. Um, and then there's this other thing, and I don't wanna to be too misleading about this, um, that that these birds are solely eating these food groups, you know, really the, the number one are these insect plants, um, because even if a bird is a, a seed eater, they're eating insects a lot of the year as well. Um, and, you know, think about hummingbirds. Some people think the evolution of the hummingbirds bill is because they were digging around in flowers to eat the insects that were in the flowers. Uh, you may occasionally see hummingbirds hawking in the middle of a, like a grassy field or something like that. Um, they're kind of darting around and hovering. They're going after gnats. So, um, you know, even if I say nectar plants, yes, the nectar lovers will be attracted to those plants. But if, if you want to not go wrong, insect plants are, are great for birds. So here are some of our fruit plants and we'll, we'll get into it. Um, Love the, the toyon, the heteromeles. Um, you know, this is a good size shrub. This is one great seasonal interest because you get uh, the red berries in the winter time. Um, rose family, hardwood, um, just, you know, they're, they're good shrubs. Um, this is a great one for cedar wax wings. Catalina cherry, um, so, as you can imagine, the fruits right now are very attractive. I have a uh, Catalina cherry right outside of my office window right now. Um, the flowers are, are great for pollinators. So this is, you know, a fruit tree and, and sort of an insect tree. Um, but just know this one can be messy. So the fruits get dropped on the ground and, and the pits are on the ground and there are half, there's half eaten flesh 
on the ground and there's there's bird poop. Um, so, you know, I love it because to me that 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 means life. Um, but for many people that that means a big old mess to clean up. So just consider this uh, when you're looking at some of these materials. Uh, love the frangula. Uh, there are so many different varieties. You can you can get lower growing creeping frangula. Um, you can get more of the erect upright frangula. Um, beautiful fruits. The flowers are are somewhat um, conspicuous or inconspicuous, but um, they attract a ton of pollinators. And um, there's some anecdotal evidence from a study we did before I got here, but I'd heard about um, in terms of uh, beneficial insects. And this was a this was a plant that that seemed to just be a magnet for beneficial insects, which uh, again, not empirical published data, uh, anecdotal, but something to consider. Uh, love the Rogers red. Uh, so this is a, a cultivar. It's not a, a pure California grape. Uh, I believe it's back crossed with one of the, um, you know, table grapes or something like that, but it's a showstopper in terms of fall color. And um, last year there was uh, an Eastern bird, a gray cat bird, which we had in the garden right around this time for a couple of weeks. And it was, it was hanging out, eating all the little dried up Rogers red raisins around the garden. And I actually think the other day my window was open to my office and I, I thought I heard the mew of a cat bird. So I'm curious to see if, if uh, this bird returns this year. Um, love the Rus integrifolia. I'm sure y'all are, are fairly familiar with that plant down, down in your neck of the woods. Um, one of the cool things about this one is it uh, takes a hard pruning. Um, so we actually have a, an 80 year old uh, formal hedge of this in our courtyard. Um, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, but you can see uh, a more naturalistic pruning in, in the image here uh, and it, it tolerates it really nicely. And then uh, if you're further inland, you might want to consider like the, the Risovata uh, sugar bush. Uh, I love an elderberry. Uh, these, these can be a little tricky. Um, they can be um, drought deciduous. So right around now, the elderberry in my yard is looking very saggy uh, because it doesn't, I don't give it a lot of supplemental water. Um, if, you're, if you're okay with that, that that's fine. Um, but just know that, that it might be a little more on the thirsty side if you want it looking good all the time. Um, the flowers are, are useful. The, the fruits are useful. Uh, I've successfully used the straight stems for fire by friction, uh, like a hand drill or a bow, bow drill. The elderberry um, drill combined with a buckeye baseboard, I've had good luck with uh, making coals from that. So it's a, it's a cool, useful plant. And um, the birds really do love it quite a bit. There was a, this particular specimen last year at this time, um, there was a day when there was Western tanager, hooded oriole, um, Wilson's warbler, yellow rumped warbler, orange crowned warbler, all, all in that little shrub. And that was pretty fun. So thinking about um, seed plants, um, we have quite a few. So the, the solidago is a uh, really reliable fall bloomer. So really thinking about um, having these food sources year round for the birds is a great way to provide habitat. Um, so this is a fall bloomer. So it's going to have its um, seeds out a little bit later um, in the season, which is pretty cool. And it's a great pollinator plant. So again, attracting those insects, which uh, a lot of our birds are, are gonna be looking for uh, year round. Uh, any of the buckwheats are fantastic. They're really great larval host plants. Uh, they bring a lot of native bees. Uh, they're extremely diverse. There are so many areognums uh, in California. Uh, of course, not all of them are in cultivation, but there are a, a ton of uh, taxa and uh, cultivars excuse me, and of course, uh, lovely colors. And, you know, one of the great things that I love about uh, the areognums is uh, particularly like a fasciculatum and cinerium. After the flowers have um, gone through and uh, been fertilized, 
and they produce fruits. They, they just have this beautiful rusty cinnamon uh, seed head that then becomes a, a great seed plant for birds like uh, goldfinches and finches and sparrows and um, all kinds of other lovely feathered friends. Love the deer grass, the, the Muhlenbergia. Uh, Rigens, uh, you know, this has this develops this really lovely skirt. Um, and, and I just think it's a really nice that kind of rhythmic. This is a great one to use um, in a mass planting. Uh, you can use it as an accent too, I guess. Um, I've, I've seen it, I think, more successfully used uh, in masses um, or, or in, you know, repeating uh, multiple of them, not necessarily right up against each other. Um, but that skirt really does provide cover and of course the seeds. And then this is also a useful plant. Um, so if anybody's read Tending the Wild, this, this plant gets mentioned quite a bit. Um, those flowering stalks, um, I believe, are, are useful for basketry. Uh, our salvias, of course, really awesome for the seeds. Like I said, if you leave the persistent seed heads on, uh, they, they will attract sparrows and goldfinches and, and other birds, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I think they're just so architectural. Uh, I really like leaving the, the fruits on after the flowers have senesced. Uh, conifers, if you've got space and time, um, I recommend planting a conifer in your yard. Uh, they're, they're beautiful. They're, um, somewhat exotic uh, looking in our, our landscapes. They're great cover, uh, but they can be really messy. And uh, some of them require quite a bit of space, like that gray pine you see in the upper left. Um, you know, that's, that's a big old tree. So you gotta be ready for it. Um, consider the Pinus edulis, the little uh, pinion pine. If, if you want something a little smaller, they're, they're pretty great. Uh, Love the Encelia. Uh, this is a great one. It's short-lived, so just, just beware. Uh, this is one that could be great for that kind of successional planting if you ultimately want uh, a different design, but you're just trying to work space and do some gardening in the meantime. This can be a good kind of filler plant, um, but they can be summer deciduous and they can look a little rangy, so just beware of that. Now moving to, to nectar plants. Um, primarily we're, we're talking about hummingbirds when we're talking about nectar plants, although the Orioles and the tanagers can get in there a little bit. Uh, love, love this epilobium, uh, looking great right now. They're flowering all over, all over the garden. Um, and, you know, cool growth form. Um, you know, they, they can be a little bit deciduous if they're not getting a lot of, uh, or not a lot of, but if they're not getting all the water uh, that, that they might in other settings. Um, so if, if you're in a really low water situation, it might look a little bit sad for part of the year. Um, but if, if it's happy, it's in a good place and uh, it's doing what it wants to do, the flowers can be extremely reliable. Um, the desert willow, so I guess we're, we're kind of moving outside of the California floristic province, but native to the geography of California, more of a Sonoran plant, um, use it a lot down in, in Tucson, uh, really sculptural, um, you know, the cousin of the Hakaranda, same family, so, you know, I kind of think of it as, as like a more native substitute in some ways, uh, the flowers are pretty similar. The fruits are, are quite different, of course, and the, the leaves are different. Uh, but this is a nice, really nice plant. Um, and it can really flower if, if it's happy. Mentioned the Dudleyas, uh, quite a variety of them. Um, I, I do think there, there is a question of um, just knowing whether you have Dudleya populations adjacent to, to your home, um, wild Dudleya populations, they're really promiscuous. Um, they, they can hybridize really easily. So the, I think there is a little bit of a, for those of us that really love our, our native plants and love our wild native plants and think about native plant genetics, I do think this is a consideration if you live in an area with, with rare Dudleyas not too far away from you, um, consider either trying to plant those Dudleyas in your yard 
or um, finding different taxa, because if, if it's within the same pollinator network, I think there is a question of uh, kind of diluting the genetics. And, and I don't know how much data there is around that, but that is a discussion I've, I've heard people mention. Uh, so just an, an interesting consideration that, that I think this audience might be particularly um, keen on knowing about if, if you didn't already. Uh, but beautiful plants, and this is the larval host plant of the Sonoran blue. And if you haven't seen a Sonoran blue butterfly, you should look up a picture because they are very, very, very beautiful, um, albeit small butterflies. Love the hummingbird sage, uh, you know, sort of in the name. Uh, this one spreads rhizomally. Um, it can be drought deciduous. Um, it's great for a dry shade garden under oaks. And uh, the Avis Keaty selection is, is kind of cool. It has sort of yellow flowers. I don't know if it makes it less attractive to hummingbirds, uh, but Avis Keaty was a, a long time volunteer here at the Botanic Garden. And she apparently found a wild population with these yellow creamy flowers that she showed to Dara Emery, who then collected and propagated and uh, created that selection uh, as the story goes. Uh, notable penstemon, I mean, Again, sort of in the name, really beautiful plant. Um, they can be kind of short-lived. They can look a little bit sad or weedy when they're not in full bloom, but they, they will self-seed and they're green. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, and it's, it's just a lovely plant when it's flowering. Moving on to the, the insects. Um, you know, if you can grow an oak, that's, that's a, a beautiful thing. Um, so consider growing some oaks because there, there are literally hundreds of insects that rely on uh, oaks as a host. I think there are at least 200 taxa in California of lepidopterans, butterflies, and moths alone that rely on oaks. Um, and then, of course, you, you also have the seeds, the acorns, which are great for quite a few of our um, year-round resident birds. Baccarus is, is pretty awesome. Um, the Baccarus pilularis, the coyote bush, um, is a good one. They are dioecious, so just uh, beware. You, you may find yourself with just a pollen-bearing or just a fruit-bearing uh, individual, so you might want to get a couple. Um, the pigeon point cultivar is kind of cool. It, it kind of spreads. Uh, pigeon point is a, a really cool spot up in the central coast. Uh, highly recommend you go. It's great for tide pooling. So check out Pigeon Point on a low tide and uh, you will you will be grateful that you did. Uh, but they can get a little rangy. Uh, they do take a hard pruning. We have a maze, a little children's maze uh, made out just uh, entirely of baccarus, which is pretty neat. Uh, around here, I, I recommend the Ceanothus megacarpus, uh, maybe Ceanothus spinosus or um, well, Thrissifolius is another one further south. Griseus might be another one that's more appropriate for you all. I, I recommend you just look up some of your local Ceanothus. Um, up here in, in Santa Barbara, we like this one, the, the Santa Barbara snow. Uh, so in early spring, the San Inez Mountains on the south side will just be white with these flowers. Um, they can be a little um, rangy. So, um, you know, just what's your aesthetic preference? I mentioned Cercocarpus um, in the rose family it has these beautiful, whoops, sorry about that, uh, has these beautiful fruits, um, really sculptural, architectural. Uh, it's a great screen plant. Uh, so you can plant it in a row and create a, a visual screen if you like, or uh, you know, on a Western face close to your house, get some, some shade on the house in the summertime uh, with that Western sun. Uh, so it's uh, useful um, sort of in a permaculture sense too. Uh, and then just all around gold star plants. Uh, again, love the oaks. If you're um, a little space deprived, think about a scrub oak, like a berbertifolia. They're still pretty slow growing, but it's not gonna get quite as big. Um, and you, you can find those, those are in the trade. Um, you know, just beware of your summer watering. Uh, they tend not to like that so much. Um, and then, you know, depending on your on your site, you might be able to grow uh, one of the deciduous 
oaks if if you really want that deciduous look though for a lot of us uh on the coast in southern california we're going to have a hard time growing those uh deciduous oaks um love the the california sagebrush I, I mentioned the canyon gray cultivar you see an example of that on the left where it has the more compact mounding um sort of growth form which i think is is really beautiful and rhythmic and makes a, a nice ground cover and, and really provides a lot of habitat. Uh, whereas on the right, uh, you see more of the upright, um, kind of more typical um, growth form that you see uh, throughout the South Coast and, and its range. It's got that beautiful aromatic foliage. It can be drought deciduous. So if you're looking for things that are gonna look great year round, um, maybe this one's gonna be a little bit uh, of a challenge for you. I love an atriplex. Uh, my, my plant materials professor in grad school called um, quail bush instant habitat. Um, they're really cool plants. The birds love the seeds. Birds love hiding in them. Uh, there are tons of insects that are attracted to them. They're really drought tolerant. They're, from what I understand, used in some level of phytoremediation and they can take up heavy metals and, uh, you know, survive in some really harsh conditions. They're super cool plants. Um, and yeah, they're the relatives of spinach, beets, and Swiss chard, which is kind of cool. Uh, love the gooseberries and the currants. Uh, they're just, you know, lovely, wonderful flowers, wonderful fruits, wide variety. Uh, some are deciduous, um, some are year are, are, are evergreen, and um, just really neat really neat plants uh, and, and quite a few varieties of those. You sort of can't go wrong um, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you can keep it alive. Uh, a, a willow is, is just an incredible bird habitat, bird magnet. They, they get a lot of galls. Um, so you may not um, find that you particularly like how they look <laughs> sometimes, but that's great for birds. Birds love to eat those, those little galls. And then this sandbar willow, the Salix exigua, uh, tends to be a little more compact. Um, so, you know, if you don't have a lot of space, some of these willows can get really big. And uh, again, rhizominous. So if you have like a gray water, um, mulch basin, something like that, that's going to be a little more wetted throughout the course of the year, um, it can really take over in that area, but they are thirsty plants. So, so make sure you're in a, a spot with, um, with some water available to it. Uh, so, you know, wrapping it up, we've, we've got lots of resources for you. Uh, of course, Calscape was mentioned. That's, that's a really wonderful resource. Um, the Botanic Garden, we have some resources. We are going to be doing a website refresh in the next six months. So check us out now, but definitely check us out again in 2022. Uh, we're hopefully going to streamline a lot of these materials, make it easier to find uh, some of our materials, have more of our uh, previous publications available for download, things like that. Um, the National Audubon Society is pretty hot on this topic uh, for reasons I've already discussed. They have a Plants for Birds finder. Um, it's not it's not the best, honestly. Uh, there are some mistakes, but it, it's good and it, it communicates which birds or which kinds of birds you might attract with that plant. So it's useful for that. And then of course, good old fashioned books um, are, are worth checking out. And um, thanks to lots of folks that provided images and feedback and thoughts on this. And that's, that's all I have. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Scott. That was a fabulous talk. Um, so we have uh, some time for questions if people have questions. Just feel free to unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, before we get to the questions, I will add that um, uh, we are having our plant sale coming up. Ordering is starting uh, tomorrow, or actually, I think after midnight tonight. Um, so it's a great opportunity to buy some of the plants that um, Scott was talking about, um, especially for people that are um, uh, 
uh, tuning in from um, the House Virtus, Torrance area, uh, South Bay. Um, you know, the plants that we'll have at our sale are plants that do well in, in our area. So um, just be careful about that. Uh, I would like to emphasize what Scott said that if you are, if your house is right next to the preserve, you do want to be really careful um, about planting something that's from a uh, different area of California. Um, and then also before we get to the questions, I did want to remind everybody uh, tomorrow is the election. So if you haven't voted, please do. Okay, whoever had the question, go ahead. Hi, um, this is uh, Tuchas here. Uh, I wanted, uh, I had actually a couple of questions. Uh, one of the things about um, that I've been um, kind of trying to rally people around uh, with regard to birds is light pollution um, and the, uh, the use of the uh, bright white LEDs uh, that are, in, uh, I've noticed that um, in my neighborhood, there's been an increase in that and a decrease in birds. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about that. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you is, are you, uh, uh, how do you feel about biophilic structures, uh, living structures uh, that are starting to have um, areas for birds to actually live on, like on a house uh, uh, with these new biophilic structures? Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree that light pollution is a, a problem for birds and it's, it's a problem in general. I want to be able to see the stars. Um, and so I, I think, you know, considerations for, for downlighting and uh, other uh, sorts of re regulations are, are worth noting. I, I don't have a ton of expertise on, on that particular subject. And then um, I have to be honest, I'm not super familiar with those biophilic structures, uh, I guess, my, my big question would just be ensuring hygiene and making sure we don't have uh, too many animals oftentimes, you know, and this is another maintenance consideration is uh, just know that if you're creating habitat for birds, especially on the ground plane, you're also creating habitat for rodents. So do consider um, kind of how you're buffering some of these plantings. Uh, maybe you don't want to make that really dense low growing planting on the foundation planting of your house, uh, because that's gonna have, create places for animals to, to hide uh, and things like that. So, I mean, I guess with these structures, that would just be my cons consideration is what's the compartmentalization of, um, you know, is, is, is fecal matter going to be exchanged? Are there other organisms that might be attracted to these um, habitat features that you're creating within your home structure that, that might, mean that mice are going to be getting in there and, and taking over or, or other critters. And so I, not necessarily a judgment on it, but just a consideration in terms of design. Thank you. Sure. Looks like Anne has a raised hand. Yeah, Scott, um, I was a little bit slow on the uptake uh, earlier. I wanted to make a comment when you asked for them, but oh, sorry. one thing to consider is when we're in Southern California, you don't have to travel far to get into a different habitat type. Um, we started our native garden back in 94, 95 and uh, bought plants from like anywhere in California and a lot of them died. One of the things that we've discovered was important is that you need to plan for the habitat you have. So we happen to live in the beach area. We get a lot of fogs and overcast. We can see out from our, the back of our house where it's sunny, but it's overcast at our house. And that has really driven our choice of plants. So you can't create a habitat from somewhere else if you're in an area that won't handle it. So have you considered working with people on the habitat area that they're in. I mean, you don't have to move far to get into a different one. If you go into the Midwest, you can get on a plane, fly, fly into an hour and land yourself in the exact same kind of habitat area. You can't do that in Southern California. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's where your site analysis comes in. And, and you have to understand where you are and what your abiotic and biotic conditions are. So if you're in a fog belt, you have to make sure you're selecting plants that can tolerate 
fog. And that's one of the reasons some of those oaks won't do well on the coast and other plants won't do well along the coast. So I, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I think those considerations get made within your site analysis step where you understand where you are uh, and you have to select plants um, with those considerations in mind. I guess it was just too long ago before anybody considered that when we were doing it. But yeah, we did trial and error. And it, but it's been a whole lot of fun. Uh, we've got a bat right now living in a birdhouse in our yard and we've had juckos produce youngs and um, a, a number of variety of birds. So it's been a whole lot of fun. Well done. And I bet you have a ton of insects too. Oh, stuff I don't even know, have any clue what they are. That's the beauty of iNaturalist. If you can get a good photo, put it up there and, and there's probably some fly geek in, in the cyber web who's like <laughs> got it on, on update. And they, cause this is part of what you can do in, um, in iNaturalist is you can follow taxa. So there, there are these global experts all around the world who are interested in this type of wasp or that type of fly or this type of bee. And they'll actually get an alert when somebody posts something that they think is within that group and they'll help identify it. And that's the beauty of iNaturalist. And so if you are converting your, your space to uh, a habitat, I highly recommend you consider, and you can geo-obscure observations in iNaturalist. So if you, don't, if you don't want everybody knowing exactly where your house is, um, within the settings of your observation, you can um, obscure the, the actual location. Um, so it's in a, in a vicinity. Um, rather than like, oh, right outside my living room. So you're just leading me to invoke my current project. If you live within the uh, South Bay of, um, you know, Torrance, Redondo, Hermosa, Manhattan, and El Segundo, if you plant host plants that are good for the El Segundo blue butterfly, and I know Betty was on here, she knows about this, we could actually connect the population in Torrance area with the population in Bologna wetlands and have a whole population that enables the genetic flow and perhaps delist this butterfly. Not downlist, delist. Right it's on. currently endangered. So I will shut up at this point. Happy to take other questions or comments. Hey, hey Scott, this is uh, Brent. Hello. Hey, you mentioned a small uh, oak tree. I think it was Robertifolio or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is there mm -hmm. is there a short list of um, of other small oak trees? I don't think my yard really has the capacity for a large one, but I am interested in the small. And of the plants you mentioned, that's uh, you know probably the most important one I'm missing. Yeah, I think Berbertifolia is a pretty good one throughout Southern California. Um, I, know, I don't know how, how common it is in the trade. Uh, palmeri, um, Quercus palmeri, the desert oak. Um, Quercus pacifica, which is the island scrub oak, does pretty well in the garden, but I don't know how available that one is. Um, that one produces a really interesting hybrid with um, Lobata called the McDonald eye, which is kind of cool. Um, I, I think Roberta Folia is probably gonna be a, a best bet. It's pretty widespread. Um, Pacifica yeah. sounds the most intriguing, mostly because you know, we consider the peninsula sometimes uh, you know, one of the lost islands. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Pacifica, that's, it's a really, it's a cool plant. I like that one a lot. All right, thanks. Sure thing. Any other questions? Yes, um, uh, to just here again. I've uh, visited the Santa Barbara Botanical Garden uh, several times now, and I absolutely love it. And I just wanted to know if you could just share uh, with us, you know, the kind of bird activity that's happening around that beautiful uh, group of uh, redwoods that you have there. Yeah, I, honestly, the, the redwoods 
I would say aren't the birdiest place in the garden. Um, the creek is really nice. There's a lot of nesting that happens in the creek. So the structure is really good, uh, particularly the sycamores. Uh, so Cooper's hawks, red-shouldered hawks. Um, what I find actually the, the oaks right outside of my office window are extremely productive. I've been seeing uh, black-throated gray warblers, Wilson's warblers, orange crown warblers. People have been saying there are yellow warblers around. Uh, so all this post-breeding dispersal. Um, on the east side of the garden, there's some really nice habitat. There's been a roadrunner hanging around, which has been pretty cool. Uh, there were phenopepla breeding out there, which was pretty cool for me. Um, the, the redwoods are good for band-tailed pigeons, for sure. They really like the, the redwoods. Um, yeah, lot, lots of great habitat in the garden. I would say uh, some of the oak woodland stuff um, is, is really the, the most productive uh, as far as birding goes. And then um, I have uh, some, I'm on a hillside and it, it gets very hot and we have some old uh, coast live oaks there. And I haven't, uh, I noticed I haven't seen that many birds lately. Uh, what I have been seeing are a lot of squirrels. I have been seeing hawks, uh, Cooper's hawks, red tail hawks. Yeah, worth watching. Somebody asked in the chat whether the recording will be posted online and the answer is that it's the YouTube channel for CNPS. And um, so yes, this talk will be posted. So have your friends watch it, watch it again, because um, it was a great talk. And uh, so um, does anybody else have anything uh, they want to say? I was just going to ask one quick question. Um, so Scott, if one we're going to visit the the Santa Barbara Botanical Garden. What what's your favorite time of year to go? Hmm. Um. Hmm. I I like. Well, I mean, sp spring is just kind of undeniable, right? I mean, you you just the flowers are incredible. The smells are incredible. The color is vibrant. Uh, particularly March, April, early May, the creek is most likely to be running. Um, and so that's, that's just kind of a magical time. But I really like fall in the garden too. Uh, we're really getting into a nice season, um, you know, especially like after the first rain or so. Uh, but right now that Rogers red is really starting to turn throughout the garden. The oaks are starting to drop acorns. Uh, the epilobium and the solidago are all blooming in the meadow. Uh, the areogonum is, is kind of getting towards the end of the season. So you have those beautiful checkerboard colors of creamy and rusty. Um, I, I think, you know, if you, especially if you can find a cool morning uh, in, in early fall, mid fall, uh, that's really lovely. Um, and then if, if you can get up here on a winter day when it's really raining, that that's cool too. So I kind of cheated, um, but in terms of the the plants, spring is probably where it's at. Actually, I got to taste my first Rogers Red a couple of weeks ago. What'd you think? Um, I really liked it. Um, I think it. I'd say it's mixed with Merlot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it also depends on the terroir. Well, they dried up pretty fast. I'm sorry, Megan. I had to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Kathy. We're good. <laughs> I did have one other question. I'm sorry I'm asking so many questions. Um, do, are, uh, are there any benefits uh, for birds with uh, poison oak? Sure. Yeah, they, they eat the fruits. They use it as cover. You kind of need a lot of it for it to be good cover. Um, poison oaks are great native plant. It's awesome. Okay, good. Because I've got a bunch of them springing about on our hillside near our oak trees. And uh, 
um, they, they, they're uh, calling the shots. I've tried to remove some, but man, they are calling the shots. So um, thank yeah, you. What I've heard for removal is um, if you're, if you've got, if you're brave, when they go deciduous in the winter time, you, you cover yourself in your personal protective equipment and you pull it up as much as you can. And then you sheet mulch it, just sheet mulch the heck out of that area. Um, so cardboard and put mulch on top of it. And even if you can do a couple layers of that, um, so you pull it back really hard and sheet mulch that area really hard. And um, it'll, it'll take years uh, if you have a well-established patch, but that's a way to avoid using uh, chemicals. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I, wanna, I wanna keep the, the stuff that's on the steep part of the hillside where not a lot of people will walk, but the part where people will walk, I, I, I just don't want people getting rashes. Yeah, of course. And I saw a comment in the chat about availability of Quercus berbertifolia. I, I actually don't know how available it is. This is where I go to Calscape uh, because Calscape has that link. Uh, how many nurseries carry this plant? And it'll at least give you a short list of nurseries you can call and look at uh, the, the locations of those nurseries. And that'll give you a, a nice lead on uh, phone calls you can make. I planted my yard a little different than most people. I planted it, planted, I selected plants that bloomed at different times of the year. So mm -hmm. different areas of my yard bloom at different times. Like the, right now the Catalina uh, fuchsia is blooming and mm -hmm. it's, a huge bush now, but uh, my my front yard changes color during the year. I have bunny yeah, pads. that's a that's a great principle. Pardon? Oh, that's a great principle. I would also advocate for utilizing um, different size flowers if you can, because if you think about it, the different size flowers are going to attract different size pollinators, and the different size pollinators are all going to have different functions in the ecosystem. And so you're, you're casting that wide net. Yeah. I have different sizes, not real big ones, but uh, uh, they're, they're different colors. Uh, in the backyard, I have a, I planted a, uh, an, uh, a, uh, a live oak acorn about 20 years ago. And I don't know which variety it is, but it came out of the uh, San Gabriel, not the San Gabriel Mountains, the uh, Anza Borrego area. Hmm. I didn't get it out of the park. It came off of private property. Uh, but it's, I have never seen any blooms on it. Hmm. But it's about 15 inches in diameter right now. Wonderful. That's what they say, that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Next best time is today. Okay, well, I think um, we will thank you again, Scott. And um, again, everybody can uh, hear it again on YouTube um, and I'm sure you can go up there to uh, Santa Barbara and look up Scott, check out the, uh, the garden. So everybody take care. And uh, remember, we need uh, volunteers for the plant sale, uh, which is going to be just before our next meeting. Um, so stay tuned. Next month's meeting is going to be a conservation update with Nick Jensen from our state chapter. Um, so it's going to be really great. Another really great meeting.